if you're not exercising your creativity, then you may not be having fun and you may not be enjoying life and you may not really be, you may be suffering. But uh, exercise those creative abilities, self-expression, etc., and life opens up, right? <laughs> Uh, my song is called Little House, Big World, Baha'i Kubo, Malaking Mundo. It's in many languages. It's about a little house in a big world, and you all, we're all part of that. And it's fun to work with the boom booms. They did some wonderful harmonies. It's really exciting. You are more beautiful than the morning. Good job, boys and girls. There was a lot leading up to it, uh, getting the artists together with each other and them going over the songs. We set up all the musicians so that, so that anything could happen. We had our arsenal of instruments put in position so we could scramble the battle stations quickly. Yeah, that's a fun song. It's the best guitar in the world. In a classic sense, like the old Stax Records days or Motown, where someone would say, and I want the horns to go bop, 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 and I want this to happen, and you just respond and try to give them what they wanted. And then next, let's do it again. What is it? So you just went candy shop. Candy shop. Get some more licks in the candy shop. Yeah, a little two bar instrumental. Yeah, bring in art. Some of the people that expressed an interest had actually never been involved in music before. Hey, Art. How are you doing, man? Hey, Art. And working with our collaborators, um, it just made the process that much, much easier. What we're going to do is be relentless and put this down in a structure. But you can be out there telling us, I don't think that's funky, dudes. It's not funky enough. <laughs> nah. You could be uh, saying, can but I only want. I need a little more faith. <laughs> <laughs> For a march around the block, but it always make you teacher to the candy shop. Uh, if you go back to my injury, I sat around for the next two or three years after this wheelchair thing, wondering what I was doing, where I was going, and what was you know what was the point of it. But after I kind of took up this artistic dare and started painting, I went all over the place with my ideas. And when I started to put my heart into my life. I realized that with the writing is where the freedom is. Right? So I'm, I'm digging the floor tom action and the verse. Yeah, with Craig Northey and the voice is really cool, man. And to have uh, Brian Adams' drummer uh, playing with me, man, it was so huge, you know? Like, he's just so big, man. I was like, wow. <laughs> Glenn David, like, just a full on rocker, and he is excited about his rock. We, we rocked it. It was awesome. Being in that little cubby hole and having the microphone in front of me and seeing the band outside was absolutely phenomenal. Oh, yeah. In the beginning, I, I took band class, you know, at high school. I had to practice at least an hour a day. This was with an accordion. Started out with the trumpet and went to the string bass. Playing classical music, I mean, playing William Tell Overture and, and Mozart and, and Strauss. When I heard Jimi Hendrix, he kind of turned my ears around. So I think I was in grade eight when I started my first band. I remember in my grade eight graduation, I got the courage to play my acoustic guitar at the dance. After I, I had some operations on my, on my legs that made it impossible to play the accordion over the summer. And I found a guitar but I lost the ability to play guitar, so I went to study computer music, and 
Now I've been losing the ability to edit. So then I took up harmonica. Something clicked because it was more social, a more social instrument. You know, the accordion, I played an accordion band, but that's, that's like frogs getting together to mate or something. It's wonderful composing, but it's, you know, sitting and editing in the computer. Whereas harmonica, you know, it's playing, so it's fun. Due to my condition that I, I could not play, I really had to give up performing. VAMS opens up that door for, for music and, and you can really change people's lives actually, you know, when, you, when you're involved in something and you're really stoked on a project or sports, whatever it might be, and, you know, for people to get into VAMS and you know, write a song or, you know, get back on some drums or keyboard and learn some instruments, make some music, it's, uh, it's the best thing. Actually, the greatest thing was kind of Jerry's energy the whole time, just like so happy and and uh, into this whole thing. Yeah, it's really. Inspiring. Well, when you've listened to your song for over a year with just your own vocals going da na 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 na, and you get right, to right. finally hear it in the studio with a full rock band. Woo! Warehouse. It was the place where this could happen. This kind of thing could happen. And the unique thing about the warehouse first is that it exists. It's made by a musician, Brian Adams, who, who thought of all the things that studios weren't. And he put all these things in like sunlight, oxygen, space. And you go in there and you record and you don't think about anything but the music because everything in your environment is just right. This building is a heritage building. It's one of the oldest buildings in Vancouver. Uh, once upon a time, it was a sort of like a hardware and supply store. This would be in the 1850s. So they would come into Vancouver Harbor from Victoria, come here, get supplies or a boat or whatever, and then go back over to the mouth of the Fraser and then go up as far as you could go beyond hope. And then, you know, this is gold mining uh, history, you know. The, so this building is amazing. People that I've seen here before that, but usually can only last short periods of time, stayed there the whole day. They didn't want to leave. Because everybody's saying yes to everyone. Nobody's saying no. Nobody, everybody's got a good vibe. So it just worked and worked and worked. And I just keep looking at it because we're going away from these two days with most of what we have. And there's a lot of work to be done before the whole thing's finished. Go ahead. What are we doing? Start the top. One, two, three. You got me singing and a dancing and a laughing and a clapping and a skipping and a jumping and I think I'm never gonna get enough of you. You're always standing by my side and never let a day go by that you don't make me feel a high and keep on loving me no matter what I seem to do. Uh, Bams is Vancouver Adaptive Music Society and we have a studio at JF Strong, the rehab center. And we came down, we're interviewed. And, and qualified for, for, the, uh, for the program. And uh, the next day I got a call and he says, you're in, man, you're fantastic, you're a resident rocker. I look forward to hitting the studios every week and, and uh, getting a tune going on. It's just uh, it's a really wicked program. Um, well, Dave and Sam started VAMS uh, 25 years ago. Sam and I met in 1985 or so. And I remember going for a ride on a Greyhound bus with him, or something like that, that had an, a, a compartment for people with, in wheelchairs behind the rear wheel. But we struck up a pretty quick friendship, and we had a lot of things in common, and we'd both been musicians in the, before our injuries, and began to talk about the idea of developing a society that could support and facilitate access to musical expression for people with disabilities, including ourselves. Oh, you're gonna love this one. Oh, I took her out for dinner cause I thought she was a winner named Mary. Well, that sounds good. Before my injury, music was everything. And then become a quadriplegic and you got all these pressures and stresses and you know, confusion and frustration, then you need music more than ever. And that is 
time when you look at the keyboard and you, you know, what do I do with these? She said she needed loving, that she been through several dozen, I got Then what happened? I think what happened was we came around at the time MIDI came, and we grabbed it and maxed it out technology-wise. There was no model we had. There was no example, you know, mm -hmm. quadriplegics playing music. You know, mm -hmm. that wasn't really anything in anybody's vocabulary or anybody's, uh, you know, reality. Mary. That's not so good. Mary. You could tell you had four guys who just love music, so we just. Uh, Kept going down the road with it, and then it led to, to do, you know, doing live performances. And we were like the performance band of uh, the Vancouver Adapted Music Society. Yeah, I think, in, you know, we were looking at a period when uh, we were still at a threshold of people accepting others that had disabilities. I shouldn't say accepting, it's just that awkward about being around people with disabilities. I think that was Brentwood Mall, as I yeah. recall. Yeah, exactly. Uh, people would be, we were playing, I think I remember in front of a shoe store, and uh, people were just window shopping. We were just another window in a way. People were just kind of like, oh yeah, moving on, you know. We were beside the mannequins, <laughs> and we were these quadriplegics yeah. playing music, you know, oh well, <laughs> just another yeah, uh, sort of, gimmick. Yeah, you know, they uh, didn't quite know what shopping. to do with us, you know. I don't mind, but, you know, I think that's part of the whole uh, purpose of what we were doing, was to to get out there, you know, and actually show people that uh, we can play music and, and uh, there's no reason why we shouldn't be playing music. Not that we're, you know, necessarily great musicians given the way we adapted and we were just learning this new approach to music, really. Sam was a great, uh, a great chatter during throat song, so he found funny ways of, you know, introducing us as the band. And I think he, he said, you know, we, we're an all disabled band and we only let we only let able-bodied guys in if they have something wrong with them, and these two guys are morally disabled. So I think I think that was his angle, right? Um, yeah, it's too bad. Sam won uh, in politics and left music. <laughs> he made a great musician, wrote some really great songs. I think I, for a number of years I tried to put a lot of effort into writing my own material, doing my own thing, kind of not wanting anybody's help, wanting to prove something. And the more time I spend working with other people, the more time I realize that that's really where the kick is, you know, to, to watch somebody else's face light up and see that they can do something, they can write something, they can... Well, if I didn't have this program, I would I would just be at home playing video games all day with nothing else to do. So the guitar gives, gives me m more stuff to work on for the future as a career. Anything's possible if you try and work at it. <laughs> This song is really taking on like a really big, legendary, sweeping vibe to it. Yeah. I think he's excited about it. For the first time in my life, found the The odds and, and all the other uh, bands that we have we said this album is going to be phenomenal, let alone uh, that evening. Hello. Hooray that the show begin. I've been ready.
it's been wonderful to collaborate with musicians in town and, and the videographers like yourself. And it, it's, it's a great place and I'd like to just see it continue.